All right. Hi, everyone. This is our first video on chapter 26, which is our fluid balance chapter. This is a perfect chapter to follow the urinary system since we spend a lot of time in the urinary system talking about the kidney's role in regulating fluid balance. So obviously we can follow that up with a better, more descriptive discussion of fluid balance. And we're also gonna be talking about electrolyte balance and of course, acid-base balance and buffer systems, which is the lab that goes along with this. I'm not gonna show you this video, but if you want, if you wanna see what happens when we have an extreme fluid imbalance and electrolyte imbalance, you can see this video of an Ironman athlete uh, whose body just completely shuts down. I actually find it pretty hard to watch, but it's, a, it's an example of what can happen in the extreme. Okay, uh, that's, I'm gonna skip that. Let's talk about the outline. So in this chapter, we're gonna first talk about how body fluids are distributed in the body. And then we've got three things to talk about, water balance, electrolyte balance, and acid-base balance. All right. Okay, let's talk about water distribution. Oh yeah, getting back into it here. Excited to be here. What color can I use for this chapter? How about orange? Orange is kind of fun. All right, so we, we hold fluid in our body in, for the most part, two separate compartments. And it actually makes a lot of sense, but it's important that we distinguish the difference. So either our fluid is held inside the cells or it's held somewhere outside the cells. And it can really be that simple. So we have our intracellular fluid and anything that's held outside of our cells, which is extracellular fluid. I'd like you to know these percentages. And as we can see, about two thirds of our body fluid is found inside the cells. And that might be surprising to you. I know when I first learned that, I found it surprising. Um, our cells are very aqueous and they're, they're full of fluid. So about 65% or two thirds of our fluid is housed inside the cells, which means that the remaining fluid in our body is somewhere outside the cell or extracellular. I give you some examples here of what that could mean. It could mean the fluid in the blood, because the fluid in the blood plasma is outside the cells. It isn't inside the red blood cells or white blood cells. Or it could be fluid that's in between the cells, interstitial, in between the cells or the tissues. You don't have to know these exact percentages, but you should be able to give some examples of what extracellular places there are. So it could be in the plasma of the blood or it could be between cells. All right, so here's some pictures here on the left. We can see this is actually a picture of the kidneys and we can see the outline of the glomerulus. Oh, look at that, so cool. And then each of these are the tubules in cross section so if I wanted to see the interstitial or between the cells, you can see these arrows here are pointing to the spaces between the cells. All right, between the cells. Another example of extracellular fluid is in the plasma. So not inside the cells, but the plasma. What I do wanna point out here is in the extracellular fluid, this is where we find most of our body's sodium, extracellular. extracellular. You may remember, uh, particularly if you had me for AMP1, we talked, about, we talked about nerve impulses, the action potential, if we drew the neuron, and we talked about how to generate a nerve impulse, which is a, um, an electrical current. We talked about the flow of ions, and indeed we said there is more sodium outside the cell. And what we're gonna see on the next slide is we tend to find more potassium inside the cell. 
okay? So we tend to find a higher amount of sodium in the extracellular fluid, and that means that we, we tend to find a higher amount of potassium in the intracellular fluid. All the rest here is extra. But I just want to point out, we tend to have more sodium outside the cells in the extracellular fluid and more potassium inside the cells. Now, our first discussion is going to be water balance. So remember, we'll talk about water balance, we'll talk about electrolyte balance, and lastly, we'll talk about acid-base balance. Okay. I just paused for a drink. I'm sorry. Okay, so let's talk about water balance. We know that water, like everything else in our body, is constantly moving. So water constantly diffuses, mostly, into and out of the cells. And that's what this picture is trying to show you. We've got water moving all the time. Water can move from the digestive tract into the bloodstream as we absorb nutrients. We can absorb water from the bloodstream into the cells or into the extracellular fluid. So water is constantly moving between these intracellular compartments and the extracellular compartments. And what we're going to find next is along with this movement of water, we also have a lot of movement of electrolytes. And that's why we'll talk about electrolyte balance next. But first, water balance. So we know water is always moving into and out of the cells. So let's talk about ways in which we take on water in our body and ways in which we get rid of water. And I'm going to move ahead because I like this picture. If we take a broad view, let me go back to the black color. If you take a broad view, water balance, water balance is all about bringing in as much water into our body as we release. So we want to maintain the same fluid volume inside our body, right? So let's say that we have, I don't know, seven liters of water in our body. You want to make sure that you always have about seven liters of water in your body. But remember, we're constantly going to be losing water. We lose water through urine. We lose water through sweat. Even in the air that we exhale, there's some moisture and some water droplets. So it's a balance. So make sure you review the ways in which our body takes on water and the ways in which our body gets rid of water. And then make sure you have an idea about the proportions. So let's look at water intake. What are ways in which our body brings in or produces water? Obviously, the biggest way that we bring in water is through drinking. You don't have to know the exact mills, average mills for an adult, but just know that what is the primary way that we can bring in water or the way, we, the way in which we can bring in the most water? Drink. That's why it's so important to drink. For all the water that you lose, you gotta rehydrate. And the easiest way and the best way to do that is to drink your water. We also, Bring in some water through food. Obviously not as much as drink, but there's water in food. Certain foods have a very high water content. Um, for example, eggplant. If you ever try and make eggplant, it's really important that you salt it and let it sit for a while to draw out some of the water. Otherwise, when you cook it, it's going to be really soggy. If ever you make french fries, they have a very high water content, so it's important that you dry them out before you fry them up. And I do want to point out another way that we can take on water, and that's metabolic water. So it's showing here mitochondria, because when we do cellular respiration, which is, as we know, the process of converting glucose or fat or protein into ATP, water is one of the byproducts. Just like CO2 is a byproduct of cellular respiration, chemical reactions, so is water. It's a very small amount in humans, but it's still there. Um, a fun fact, not that this is going to be on the test or anything, but 
Uh, if you look at some of the desert animals, like uh, I think I read about this, a desert rodent, a desert rat or something. Have you ever wondered how on earth can they survive when they don't have a lot of access to water to drink? It turns out that a desert rat is better, they've adapted to be better able to recapture some of that metabolic water. And they can utilize that as a form of water gain because they don't have as much access to fluid to drink. Okay, I'm going to drink. I'm thirsty this morning. All this talk about drinking. Also make sure you review ways in which we get rid of water. And of course, the idea is to make this equal. The biggest means that we release fluid is through urine, which we talked about last chapter. Um, just make sure you reviewed some of these. This is an interesting one, cutaneous transpiration. Even if you're not sweating, there is some moisture on your skin and you tend to lose that moisture over time. So that's a way of losing some water over the course of a day. We do breathe out some water. Sweat, this is the most varied option. So depending on what the temperature is outside or what your activity level is, you may sweat more or less. And of course, there's some water in our poop. But the idea is that these should be equal. And in the course of a day or a situation or weather or activity level, these can change. So it's very important that our body is able to adapt, to maintain a balance, to make sure that we have enough fluid in the intracellular and extracellular compartments of our body. Um, if I go back, you can see... I give you some more definitions. If I didn't talk about it, you don't have to know it. So for example, for ways in which we lose water, this slide talks about insensible and obligatory water loss. You don't have to know that. I like this chart because it reminds us what we need to know. Be able to give ways in which we bring in and ways in which we get rid of water and then know which, of, which is highest for each. All right, let's talk about regulation of fluid intake. And this is the pattern we're going to follow in this chapter. So for water balance, we're going to talk about, well, what are the ways in which we can bring in water and get rid of water? And then just as important of a discussion is regulation. How do we regulate to make sure that we keep this balance? And we'll do the same thing when we talk about electrolytes and the same thing when we talk about buffer systems. So first thing, let's point out the place in our brain that is going to be overseeing this fluid balance is the hypothalamus. In AMP1, in the nervous system chapter, we, uh, if you had me, we talked about it for sure. One of the um, places in our body, in, in the brain that oversees thirst, and then also fluid balance is the hypothalamus. So let's start there. I'm gonna go ahead and you can see a nice picture here, but we don't need to go through it. We can see here, you can see this, aha. You know me and my tables. The previous slides say the same information. I personally find it easier to organize this information in the form of a chart but you have the other slides that are before this if that's gonna help you more. So for each of the fluid balance, electrolyte balance, we're gonna show you a chart and we're gonna talk about what are the ways in which we can regulate water balance. And you probably are not gonna be surprised. Over the long term, we rely a lot on hormones. And these hormones tend to impact the kidneys because that's gonna be the best way that we can alter how much water we retain or how much water we get rid of through urine. Remember, our kidneys filter between 150 and 180 liters of fluid per day. So we have a lot of access to fluid that's being filtered. And because of that, the kidneys are perfectly positioned to be able to release more or less. Let's talk about it. 
are two primary hormones that we've already heard of. That's the joy of this class. We're building a foundation. All right, our aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone. We rely on these, and they both act on the kidneys. Aldosterone is our salt-retaining hormone. We've already talked about this. And of course, ADH or antidiuretic hormone is our water retaining hormone. So I've given you the example of what happens if there is a drop in water in the body. That's a more common scenario. So if we have a drop in water, we don't have enough water, maybe we sweat out too much, maybe we didn't drink enough, Maybe it's just really hot out. Maybe our body's trying to fight a fever or trying to fight some kind of infection. So we're overactive in our chemical reactions. So we've been utilizing a lot of water. So if we have a drop in water, that could be a real problem. So any time that we have a drop in the normal amount of fluid volume, water volume, we will release both aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone. So you see how this table works? If there's a drop in water, these two hormones are released. And then you can see here, how do they work? Well, aldosterone is our salt retaining hormone. And if I have, excuse me, if in my kidneys, I tell my kidneys to reabsorb more salt, they're also going to reabsorb more water because water follows salt. So by a release of aldosterone, goes to our kidneys, tells our kidneys in those tubules to reabsorb more salt. And because water follows salt, we're also going to be reabsorbing more water. So by reabsorbing more water, we're retaining more water and releasing less water through urine. ADH is released, also goes to the kidneys, and tells our kidneys to retain more water. So it's like a double whammy. So what happens if, let's change color here, what happens if we have too much water? So if we have too much water, then we'll just inhibit these. So oftentimes we really don't need a separate set of hormones because these hormones are so powerful. If the opposite is true, if I have too much water, I can simply inhibit them. And by inhibiting them, I'm not retaining as much salt and water and I'm peeing out more fluid through urine. Okay? One more point to make. Let's go to even different. Oh, let's go to a different color. You don't have to know these now, but I want to just point you in that direction. Our next chapter is going to be the endocrine chapter. And in the endocrine chapter, we're going to be talking about these hormones more specifically. So we're going to be filling in more information. For example, we're going to find out that aldosterone is released from the adrenal glands that sit atop the kidneys. ADH is released from the pituitary gland. And then we're going to talk about what types of hormones these are. Okay, these are amino acid derivative hormones, and we'll talk about how they actually work. You don't need to know this information for now, but... Next chapter, we're going to fill in that information, which is pretty incredible that we have these hormones that we produce in the brain in the terms of ADH. Released in the brain goes all the way to the kidneys. Pretty phenomenal. Okay. All right, so that's really, we're going to try and keep it as simple as we can. So we talked about where fluid is stored in our body, either intracellularly or extracellularly. 
We talked about ways in which we bring in water and ways in which we release water. And then we talked about regulation. And of course, we focused mostly on the long-term regulation of fluid balance vis-a-vis the release of hormones, aldosterone and ADH, which act on the kidneys. Okay. Let's switch gears now and talk about electrolyte balance because, as we said, with the movement of water, we have certain electrolytes or ions moving right along with the water, and we both are important and necessary. Okay, let's first talk about what on earth electrolytes are. If you are to look for a definition of electrolytes, you will see probably many different types of definitions. I'm gonna give you the definition that I think is easiest, okay? So for me, an electrolyte is an ion that carries a current. So this is how we're going to define electrolyte for our discussion. An electrolyte is an ion that carries a current. Let's think back to ion. What is an ion? An ion is a charged particle. So if you see anything with a plus or a minus sign after it, that is telling you that it's a charged particle or an ion. Not every ion, though, has this added capability of carrying a current, meaning that when we move these ions between cell membranes, it can affect the electricity. Potassium, chloride, hydrogen, sodium, magnesium, These are all examples, even calcium, I can't forget calcium. These are examples of ions. We know they're ions because they have a plus or a minus sign sign after them. These are examples of ions that carry a current. They're charged particles that have this added capability of carrying a current. Let me give you some examples of ions that are not able to carry a current. Iron. Iron is an example of an ion. It's an ion because it has a negative sign, so it's a charged particle. But this is an ion that is not an electrolyte. It doesn't have an added capability of carrying a current. So not every ion, not every charged particle, is able to carry a current. But many ions or charged particles do have that capability. All right. Okay, let's go back to the blue. These electrolytes, these ions that have the capability of carrying a current when they flow in a certain direction, they have so many functions. And I'm gonna lay out some of the functions here. Uh, Let me just look ahead for one minute to make sure I'm not gonna repeat myself, okay. Let me let's center this and then let's, let's get to work. What are some of the important functions of these electrolytes? Electrolytes affect or function in water content and distribution. In other words, fluid distribution. So we just talked about that. We talked about how we have water inside the cells and we should have about 65% of our fluid in the body inside the cells. And then we have water outside the cells. About 35% of our water is housed in the extracellular space. Well, ions that carry a current, i.e. electrolytes, play a really big role in helping us maintain that fluid distribution, making sure that we have the right amount of fluid inside the cell versus outside the cell. Electrolytes also play a role in cell membrane potential. Do you remember 
we talked about every cell at rest. Here's a neuron, right? Every cell at rest has a negative charge on the inside compared to a positive charge on the outside right near the membrane. How did we get to have that difference in charge? Because of the movement of electrolytes. The, it's possible for us to have the inside of the cell be more negative compared to the outside of the cell because movement because of movement of potassium and sodium. Sodium flows in, potassium flows out. Potassium flows out much faster than sodium flows in, resulting in a relative negative charge on the inside compared to the outside. It is only possible to have that difference in charge or that cell membrane potential, that potential energy, is only possible to have that difference in charge because of the movement of electrolytes. And because electrolytes function <clears throat> in creating and maintaining that cell membrane potential or difference in charge, these electrolytes are also important in generating nerve impulses. Because the next step from this resting membrane potential is to open sodium channels, so sodium rushes in, and we have a depolarization where the inside becomes positive for a moment relative to the outside, and we can generate a spark of electricity. And if we continue that spark of electricity along a membrane, that is what a nerve impulse is. But a nerve impulse is only possible because of the movement of electrolytes. And... We also rely on electrolytes for muscle contraction. If we're going to have a muscle contraction, aside from needing a nerve impulse going into that muscle, which we just talked about, so we need electrolytes for that, but we also rely a lot on the binding of calcium to actin in the my, which is a myofilament deep in the muscle. So these are the four functions we're going to focus on. So electrolytes, these ions that carry a current. We're going to discuss them as having four primary functions in the body. The movement of the electrolytes is needed to help maintain fluid distribution between the inside and outside of the cells. Electrolytes are needed to maintain that resting charge or that cell membrane potential. And then from that resting membrane potential, we can generate nerve impulses, which again, we rely on the movement of electrolytes. And we also rely on electrolytes to be able to contract muscles. So the movement of electrolytes is important for so many things. We're gonna focus on two electrolytes. We're gonna focus on potassium and sodium. I'm also going to mention calcium. So actually, I lied. I'm going to talk about three. There's many other ones, but we're going to focus on these. Okay, let's talk about sodium. Sodium, we know already, is found more in the extracellular fluid. We talked about that. We talked about the overall role of electrolytes. The overall role of electrolytes is to help with fluid distribution. In the case of sodium, we know that water follows salt. So sodium has a particular role with this. If we want to really capitalize on our ability to move fluid, we can move sodium because we know that chemically water follows salt so if i move sodium in one direction either into or out of a cell water's going to go right along with it we talked about the role of electrolytes in maintaining that cell membrane potential and i'm going to add one the added function of sodium as an electrolyte is that it helps in buffering against ph which we're going to talk about later but in addition to the four functions we already talked about, add that one to sodium. It plays a role in buffering against pH changes. 
Um, in terms of sodium homeostasis, overall, it's very important. In the United States, however, having a sodium deficiency is rare. We tend to have a lot of salt in our foods, so we don't so much have a problem with sodium deficiency. Um, we probably have more of a stress in asking our body to get rid of excess. But just like we did before, even though I have information on the slides, I'm going to move towards a chart. So all this information we're going to summarize in this chart. So see if you can follow along with me. I may go back to these previous slides to point out some information. But really, I don't know, I, I find that this summarizes things well. So what's the first thing I would start with? Well, we're going to be talking about three hormones. Two of them we already know. We know antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone is our water retaining hormone. We already know aldosterone. Aldosterone is our salt retaining hormone. And now we're adding another one, atrionatiuretic peptide hormone. I actually discussed this in the previous chapter. Let me go back here and we can find, so we already know aldosterone, salt retaining hormone. Let's see here. We know that ADH is our water retaining hormone. I mentioned ANP, atrionatiuretic peptide hormone. I mentioned this last chapter. ANP is our salt releasing hormone. So let's go back here. Atrionatiuretic peptide hormone, typically shortened as ANP, is our salt releasing hormone. So it tends to be the opposite of aldosterone. If aldosterone is our salt retaining, ANP is our salt releasing. So I would start there maybe. Maybe you could start understanding this chart by going through the three hormones. Two of them we already know, ADH and aldosterone. Okay, aldosterone is our salt retaining hormone, tells us to retain more salt, aldosterone. ADH is our water retaining hormone, tells our kidneys to retain more water. And then the added hormone here is ANP, atrionatiuretic peptide hormone, salt releasing. After you memorize or understand that information, let's next talk about what each of these hormones is released in response to. And this is just a memorization thing. It turns out ANP and aldosterone are released in response to changes in overall fluid volume. This is just a memorization thing, okay? So in other words, what is triggering the glands, in the case of aldosterone, for example, what is triggering the adrenal glands to release aldosterone? And the trigger is a change in fluid volume. ANP and aldosterone are released in response to changes in fluid volume. On the other hand, ADH, which is kind of interesting because ADH is our water retaining hormone, but our water retaining hormone just so happens to be released in response to changes in osmolarity or changes in the solute concentration. That is just a memorization thing, okay? So after you memorize, what are the functions of the three hormones? Water retaining, salt retaining, or salt releasing. Next, talk about, memorize, which, what each is released in response to. ADH is released in response to a change in osmolarity or solute concentration. 
versus A and P in aldosterone, which are released in response to changes in fluid volume. All right, next step. So you see how I'm trying to build it. So hopefully it won't be as overwhelming to you. This is why you can't wait until the last minute, folks, to study this one. I know it's just a chart, but there's kind of a lot of information in this chart. So leave yourself plenty of time. And my suggestion is to memorize it in steps, okay? All right, so third step. If it were me, for example, I might next memorize which of these hormones is released when sodium is too high. As I said before, that's our more common scenario if we think about our diet, for example. But I would think, what are the two hormones or what hormones are released when our sodium concentration in the extracellular fluid, because that's where we find more of it, what are the two hormones released when sodium is too high? And the answer is the two abbreviated ones. That's how I came to memorize these, because our two abbreviated ones are ADH and ANP. All right, so step number three, what two hormones are released if our salt becomes too high? What two hormones are released when our salt becomes too high? The two abbreviated ones, ADH and ANP. All right? And then we can just make sense of it. So if our initial problem is too much salt, how am I going to fix it? If this is my problem, I've got to do things to decrease the sodium concentration. And what are hormones that can be released to help decrease salt concentration? Well, obviously I can release ANP. ANP is our salt releasing hormone. So if my initial problem is too much salt, well, it makes sense to release ANP because that's our salt releasing hormone. ANP goes to the kidneys, tells the kidneys to release more salt. If I release more salt in urine, I've helped to fix my initial problem of too much salt. Another way to reduce the salt concentration is to release ADH. And this one might take a little bit more thought, but I know you can do it because if I have too much salt and I release ADH, ADH is our water retaining hormone. If I retain more water, it will cause us to retain more water, which can dilute the relative sodium concentration. So for whatever amount of salt that I have, I have two options. I can get rid of that salt by releasing it in the urine through uh, signaling by ANP hormone. Or if I have too much salt, another option I have is to bring in more water. So even though the, the absolute amount of salt is the same, if I bring in a ton more water, it will reduce the relative concentration of sodium. It'll dilute it. Dramatic pause. <laughs> you can totally do this, okay? So... The third thing I would memorize is what hormones are released when we have too much salt? And what hormones are released when there's too much salt? The abbreviated ones, ADH and ANP. And if I know what they do, because I already memorized that, I can figure it out. So if I have too much salt and I release ANP, well, that makes sense because what is ANP? Salt releasing hormone. All right, if I have too much salt and I release ADH, which is our water retaining hormone, okay, that makes sense too, because if I have too much salt, one way to help that, at least temporarily, is to reabsorb more water, which helps to dilute the sodium and reduce the relative sodium concentration. If you memorize that, you probably don't need to memorize the other one, because it would just be the opposite. 
So if I've already memorized, let's see what color I can use. Um, I guess I can do more red, huh? Or pink, how about pink? Oh yeah. If I've already memorized that when sodium is too high, I release the two abbreviated ones, then by process of elimination, I already know what hormone is released when there's too little sodium. And that of course would be aldosterone. And that makes sense. If I have too little sodium, it makes sense to release aldosterone. If I have too little sodium in the body, it makes sense to release our salt retaining hormone. But really, if you just memorize which hormones are released when there's too much salt, by process of elimination, you already know what happens when there's not enough. All right, how's that setting with you? All that information is up here. You can see a nice chart here if that helps you. Um, I do make a point up here that changes in sodium intake and output do not directly affect sodium concentration in the extracellular fluid, um, but it does indirectly. But you don't need to worry about that. That's just extra information in case you were curious, but don't, don't worry about it. We talked about ADH. ADH we talked about is released in response to a change in osmolarity. You can see here it's released in the hypothalamus. What we're going to learn next chapter is that it's actually produced in the hypothalamus, but released from the posterior pituitary gland. We'll get there. Um, and ADH is released when there's too much sodium. We talked about that. We talked about ANP being our salt-releasing hormone. And ANP is released if there's too much salt. Then we talked about aldosterone, which is our salt-retaining hormone, and that's released when there's not enough salt. And we talked about aldosterone being released in response to fluid volume. Okay, so everything on those slides is summarized in this chart. And as I suggested to you, you may want to memorize it in part. So the first thing to memorize was the hormones themselves and what they do. ADH is water retaining, ANP is salt releasing, aldosterone is salt retaining. Then you're gonna memorize the second column, what they're released in response to. And then you're gonna choose one of these. If it were me, I would memorize the third column. What hormones are released when there's too much sodium? And because I already memorized what they do, I can make sense of it. And of course, I don't need to say this because we already know it, but just to make sure we drive the point home, all three of these hormones have the majority of their actions at the kidneys. All right. Whew. Who knew this was going to be so much fun? Um, so, of course, if we have an imbalance... That can be really bad of electrolytes. So we're talking about sodium. You can see I put a star beside hyponatremia. Hyponatremia, as the prefix suggests, is a condition when there's too little sodium. You don't have to know the actual amount, less than 130 milliequivalents per liter. Don't worry about that. Um, hyponatremia could occur because of not enough salt, but... Most of the cases we see actually of hyponatremia occur because of taking in too much water. Um, you know, by now you know me, I've done Ironmans and marathons and all that stuff. So a lot of marathoners or Ironman athletes can, can actually get hyponatremic, but typically it's not because they don't have enough sodium in itself. It tends to be because they drink too much water. And by drinking too much water, it lowers the relative sodium concentration or it dilutes the sodium. Have a look at some of the symptoms of hyponatremia. Check this out. So we're talking about hyponatremia, a condition of not having enough salt. Look at some of the signs and symptoms 
central nervous system dysfunction. How could that be? I'll tell you how it can be. We remember our nerve cell, our neuron. We have more sodium outside the cell, more potassium inside the cell. At rest, inside of the cell is negative compared to the outside. If I want to generate a nerve impulse, let me change color here. Let's go with green, like these two colors together. Actually, navy, because I'm a, a University of Illinois graduate, so we'll do the Illini colors. Um, this is how it should be. And in order to make a nerve impulse, we open sodium channels to rush in, to depolarize the membrane, turn it positive for a period of time, and then generate an electrical current that goes down the axon. In order to do that, we need sodium in the extracellular fluid. So if I don't have enough sodium in the extracellular fluid, then I'm not able to have enough sodium to rush in the neuron to depolarize it. So you can have a problem making a nerve impulse. Oh, so cool. Okay, so we talked about salt. Now we're going to come back around and talk about potassium, okay? So we already talked about potassium. We said that it was found in higher amounts inside the cells. And we're going to talk about its functions being the same as sodium. So we talked about, um, let me, I'm just, I'm just going to write them down at the bottom. What were the four functions we talked about for electrolytes? Well, for potassium in particular, um, it plays a role in fluid balance, just like salt did. It plays a role in fluent, fluid balance. It plays a role in that membrane potential, making sure that we have a resting charge or potential energy at rest. Because when we have that membrane potential, then we can make a nerve impulse. So we'll actually, we'll focus on those three. Even though we talked about sodium more with a nerve impulse, it's just as important to have potassium moving where it needs to be. So in actuality, to generate a nerve impulse, we got to have sodium moving in one direction and potassium moving in the other direction. And with both moving where they should be, we can properly generate a nerve impulse. What we're going to find is that potassium and sodium tend to be in opposites. So wherever there's a lot of sodium, so for example, if I'm looking at the extracellular fluid, we have a lot of sodium. Wherever we have a lot of sodium, we tend to have low amounts of potassium. So they work in opposites. What about the intracellular fluid? We know that the intracellular fluid has a lot of potassium. But guess what? Wherever I have a lot of potassium, I have lower amounts of sodium. So suffice it to say, potassium and sodium tend to be distributed in opposite. If in a given area you have a lot of sodium, you're going to have low amounts of potassium under normal circumstances. If in a given location you have a lot of potassium, we're going to have less sodium. So guess what? Knowing this, it is the same chart. Follow me here. It's the same chart. It's just that in the column where I say there's high sodium, there's low potassium. In the column where we previously said low sodium, now there's high potassium. So you really don't have to memorize this again. Let, let's think back to what we learned in the sodium chart. In the sodium chart, because it's the same three hormones. You already memorized ADH, AMP, aldosterone. We already memorized what they respond to. And what we talked about, what two hormones are released when there's too much salt? 
When there's too much salt, what two hormones were released? The abbreviated ones, ADH and ANP. So if I memorized what two hormones were released when there was too much salt, then I've already memorized what two hormones are released when there is not enough potassium. So I just substitute in, okay, these hormones were released when there's too much salt. And that means that these hormones are also released when there's not enough potassium. On the other hand, we memorized process of elimination. What hormone is released when there's not enough salt? Aldosterone. Which means that if aldosterone is released when there's not enough salt, aldosterone is released when there's too much potassium. So you don't need to rememorize this, people. If you know the salt chart, if it were me on an exam, I'd get a separate sheet of paper and I would draw this chart out. Right, And then I would have it for reference and I might write down, okay, what two hormones are released when there is too much salt? Okay, ADH and AMP. And then at the top, when I put too much salt, I would also put not enough potassium. Trying to help you out here. All right. Just like we talked about an imbalance with, with sodium being hyponatremia, we're going to talk about an imbalance that is more common with potassium. Whereas it's more common to be hyponatremic, it's more common to be hyperkalemic, having too much potassium. And these can happen, happen concurrently, having not enough sodium in the extracellular fluid and too much potassium in the extracellular fluid. By the way, I didn't say this before, but if you want to... If you want a tip in ways to memorize these terms, look at the middle letter or letters. We know that the symbol for potassium is K. So hyper or hypokalemia has a K right in the middle. We talked about hyponatremia. What's the symbol for sodium? Na. What's in the middle of the word hyponatremic? Na. That's how I remember it. Okay, so the two imbalances I'd like you to know, because they're the more common ones, hyponatremic, a condition of having not enough salt in the extracellular fluid. Hyperkalemia, a condition of having too much potassium in the extracellular fluid. So here we can see hyperkalemia. And I want to point out with one of the symptoms and signs of hyperkalemia has to deal with the heart. I mentioned this way back at the beginning of the semester with the heart. We talked about some of the differences between skeletal and cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle is much more reliant on calcium and potassium. And because potassium is an important ingredient in heart contraction, cardiac muscle contraction, having too much of it can actually lead to arrhythmias or disturbances in the regular heart rhythm, which is unique to hyperkalemia. That can be a real problem. Okay, last thing we'll talk about in this video, because I'm going to end for now, and then we'll come back in our second video and talk about acid-base balance and buffer systems. Let's talk about calcium. So we talked about potassium and sodium, and they were very similar in their functions. Potassium and sodium as electrolytes help to maintain fluid balance, help to keep that resting membrane potential, difference in charge across the cell membrane. And of course, potassium and sodium play a role in nerve impulse conduction and muscle contraction. We could not have a discussion of electrolytes without talking about calcium. Oftentimes, calcium in the body travels with three plus signs. But in any case, calcium is an electrolyte. It is an ion that has a capability of carrying a current. I'm not going to go into detail about calcium too much. I mean, of course, a little bit of detail, because otherwise, why would we even be here? But I want to point out a couple things. The first thing I want to point out has to do with the functions of calcium. 
okay? We know that one of the functions of calcium is that it gives structure to bone. So we know one of the functions of calcium is that it gives structure to bone. Our bones store calcium, and because they store calcium, our bones, calcium helps to give structure and strength to bone. But that is not the only function, ladies and gentlemen. Calcium does so many other things. Oh my goodness. So bad drawing coming up ahead. Watch out. Here's my bone. <coughs> Excuse me. So, okay. We know that the bones... Oh, oh I don't want to... Okay, I'm still figuring out how to use this thing. I just want to get... There we go. Okay. We know that the bones store calcium. That's number one function. But what I want to point out is, even though we store most of the calcium in the bone, a lot of that calcium ends up leaving the bone to do other functions inside the body. We may keep 99% of our calcium stored in the bones. And at a given point in time, about 1% of our body's calcium is circulating in the bloodstream. And that may not seem like a lot, but boy, it is important. Because that 1% of calcium that circulates in the bloodstream allows that calcium to have functions all over the body. And we don't need a whole lot of it to get the job done. What do we need calcium for? Every muscle contraction. What do we need calcium for? Every time we have blood clotting. What do we need calcium for? Every time we have the actions of hormones at a target cell. Calcium does so, so much. Think about blood clotting. Think about muscle contraction. Every single muscle contracting, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth needs calcium. Every time we have a hormone interacting with a target cell, needs calcium. So sometimes I think people get caught in a trap of only thinking about calcium as functioning in the bones. And you can see why. That's what we hear most. Calcium, strong bones, strong bones, strong teeth. Okay. But what I want to get across to you is that, yes, that's an important function. Calcium gives structure to bone. But that is not the only important function of calcium. A small percentage of that calcium is constantly circulating in the blood. And as it does, calcium is needed for a whole lot of things. Every muscle contraction, every time we have blood clotting, every time we have a hormone interacting with a target cell. Okay, I think I've <clears throat> beaten that point to the ground, I hope. Okay, let's talk about calcium homeo... Oh, you know what? I'm ahead of myself. We're going to talk about calcium homeostasis more in the endocrine system. It is your lucky day. Here I was all excited to talk about it, but we'll talk about it in the endocrine system. I do want to introduce to you, though just like we had for maintaining homeostasis or regulating potassium and sodium levels, we relied on hormones, right? What were the hormones that we relied on for regulation of electrolyte homeostasis for potassium and sodium? Aldosterone, ADH, ANP, hormones. Well, to maintain calcium homeostasis, we also rely on hormones, just different ones. So when we get to the endocrine system, we're going to talk about parathyroid and calcitonin. Those are our two hormones that we rely on for calcium homeostasis. But we'll talk about those in the endocrine system chapter. Here's a chart just giving you some examples of other electrolytes, phosphate, chloride, magnesium. You only have to know what we've talked about but there are many other electrolytes that we rely on for many important things. Okay, 
We're going to end this video here, and then we'll pick up the second part of this chapter when we talk about acid-base balance.